Hi, this is Rolf from Tesla Owners US and there's more to tell about roadsters. So I had to, cut, had to cut the story short about everything what was roadster number five. And now there's more roadsters, more technology to tell and watch how they can, Pete Gruber and his company can recover brick roadster batteries or rebuild uh, roadster pumps. Uh, with all reverse engineering that and making some of the PEMs even better. You also will see an inside of a PEM power electronic module and an inside of a Model S uh, inverter. So, or actually drive inverter. Okay, watch that movie, it's gonna be really interesting. Subscribe to the channel, thumbs up. We are here again at Gruber Motors and that is that little office and there is a big garage just next to it as well and I'll show you that. Here's the garage. Okay, so let's go to the other roadsters what you have here in service. Okay, um, so just to, um, uh, to update the viewers. Um, these roadsters are sensitive to what's called battery bricking. Uh, the long and short of it is if you don't charge your car, it gets to a point where you can't revive it. You yep. put the charge cable into the charge port and it just says, oh, I can't do a thing for you. The test of solution to that at this point is a $30,000 or $29,000 battery pack replacement. What we do is we actually are able to bring these cars back to life. We have yeah. a process where we trickle charge the uh, packs to a certain level. Um, and after that, the sophisticated Tesla battery management system takes over and we can again plug in a charge cable and then restore some life in that roadster. Oftentimes we're able to bring a car back to 100% of what it was before it got bricked. There's an example there of a roadster that was collision damaged. Which, that, uh, uh, the, black, the black one here or the, the blue, dark it's, blue it's one? dark blue. Yeah. The front end is uh, pretty uh, crunched, but uh, the car actually runs and drives. We yeah. got this out of Chicago, and we were able to bring this battery pack to 164 mile range. Well, that's very good. It is very good for a, for a brick battery pack. Yeah. Now, the reason these packs get brick when they go to auction is there is a processing time, what we call a title jail. And uh, yeah. in order for the insurance company and the original owner to be satisfied with the process, it takes time to do the paperwork. And uh, eventually when the title uh, is transferred over to salvage, then the auction house can sell it. Yeah. So the problem is oftentimes these cars will sit in title jail for months. We had one that was sitting in North Carolina for over a year. It was a Model S and it finally sold. It was a flood damaged car. Oh, wow. So by the time these cars are sold at auction, they usually have a brick battery pack. We have tried uh, negotiating with the auction houses. All you have to do is go in the trunk, pull out the charge cable, plug it into 120 volts, and let that car live, rather than brick it and yeah. then reduce its value. Yeah. The insurance company makes more money, you make more money, but their uh, pet response is, we're not mechanics. So they refuse to charge these cars or to maintain them. Yeah. So what happens is uh, either it's an owner-induced uh, bricking in that they forgot to charge or it was a failure. They went on vacation for two months, went to Europe, and uh, the circuit breaker tripped and the car wasn't charged while, it, um, uh, while they were on vacation and no one was checking on the car. That's okay. why I have an app for that. <laughs> yes, there are apps. Good advice. You know, so what we do is we have these cars shipped to us and then we restore. This particular one uh, does not have a brick battery pack. What we're doing with this car is yeah. uh, rebuilding the PEM. In this power electronics module are a number of uh, discrete components such as um, capacitors, electrolytic capacitors, which have a life, um, a shelf life just like a battery yeah. or a use life. And if you don't change those periodically, about every eight years or so, they will eventually become resistive. 
the inverter starts working harder, it eventually blows IGBTs, and then you have some serious problems. We had one in Europe that actually blew a capacitor. There's a newsletter we did if you want to yeah. look it up. Yeah. And there was carnage inside that PEM. There was debris everywhere. It looked like a landmine had gone up inside that electronic uh, PEM. So it's a good idea to uh, rebuild these PEMs every eight years. And since these cars have been out since 2008, many of them are due for a PEM rebuild. Yeah. It's just a time bomb waiting to go off. Yeah. The other problem we've noticed, and we were the ones that actually discovered this uh, three years ago, there's an insulating material on the IGBTs, which are the transistors in the inverter. Yeah. The, uh, the insulating material deteriorates with age. It becomes brittle, dry, and crumbles. What that insulating material does is it prevents the case of the IGBT from shorting against ground. And when that happens, you have hundreds of volts DC that are suddenly uh, you know, finding a path to ground, blowing up IGBTs. So that's the other reason to get these PEMs rebuilt. Well, what is the short form for IGBTs? Uh, what, is, uh, what, what, is, what is the air? Uh, Integrated gate, uh, bipolar, uh, see, you caught me, I, I don't know. But I'm sure yeah. we'll Google it later on and yeah, the yeah. fact finders will straighten this out. <laughs> okay. Uh, we call them IGBTs, they're the transistors, what they used yeah. to call transistors. Okay, um, now, uh, does, did you already rework it, but or we will, you will rework that PEM here? This yeah. one, yeah, this one just came in. Yeah. Um, this one is an interesting story. Um, this is a car that uh, came from Florida. The owner is in Puerto Rico. It's a 3.0 battery pack and it's here for a recovery. Oh. So the lesson is just because you've spent $30,000 to get your Roadster battery pack replaced doesn't mean that you're immune from breaking. The design flaws are still inherent in this ESS pack. Yeah. It's the same design. You still need to charge that battery. So this one is actually coming up nicely and we feel we'll do 100% recovery on this pack. Oh, great. So, uh you are kindly, kind of uh, short going directly to the pack and, and, and charge it. There are trickle charges. Mm -hmm. and, and that takes time, right? It takes and lots of time. This one yeah. has actually been trickling for about three weeks now. And uh, the voltage currently is up to 375 volts. And this is good because it's almost full. It's so almost full, yeah. Did you try to charge it with 120 already or not? We did. The problem with this car is sometimes when they get bricked, the, uh, the battery management boards, BMBs, yeah. uh, go defective. And we think we have two bad ones in here. Once we tuned into the car, we found that two sheets were not recording any voltage. Oh. Even though it's up that high. We don't think the batteries are bad or the cells are bad on the sheets. We think yeah. it's the BMB board that can't report. Okay, good. Hey, there's one more question what I have. Sure. So, my car has now as Let's, let's go to that orange one, okay. because you said you are recovered that orange There's, one. you want to do one more video, this is a cool yes. computer that took a lot yeah. of time to set up. You might want to catch a picture of this uh, laptop communicating with the car. And oh, okay, great. The, uh, the CAN bus signals. So and it's communicating with the white one, right? Mm -hmm. So it's communicating with the car. What, what does it communicate with? So well, these are CAN bus signals that are yeah. um, that are constantly being reported, and uh, we have a decryptor that actually decodes the CAN bus signals, and we're able to get information out of the car. Okay. Also able to push information to the car. And it, this has also a nice hot top, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You got most of the cars with nice hot tops. Nice. And this is okay. another car that's waiting for a PEM rebuild. Uh, yeah. The first thing we had to do was bring the battery back to life. It had both a brick battery and a, a PEM problem. Um, yeah. So this will be on its way soon. And then the car that we have in front here Let's is go to a, that car. a car with only 3,400 miles on it. I believe it's a 2011. It's a, yeah, it's the uh, orange one here, yeah. Um, this one was brick for a long time, and I believe it was almost a year. Usually we don't try to recover packs that have been bricked that long, but uh, we were able to successfully recover this. However, we're not happy with the range. The range on this is around 88 to 100 miles. You know what? It's my range is currently on my car 115 miles effective or 130 miles ideal. Do you, do you, is that the ideal range or the uh, effective range? Um, the ideal is about 88 and the range we've gotten up to 104. Ooh. So it's, it's low. 
but it's better than when it came in because it was completely braked. Um, and now we're able to drive the car. Now, let, me, let me look at the char charge port. And I see the charge port here. Yeah. It's currently saying about 99 miles. The interesting thing is it shows 99 and it shows up to that point and then the rest of it, it does not show anything, right? So, so this car will be shipped back within the next week. Uh, we have to line up a second transporter. Yeah, a beautiful car in orange, right? I have a friend, uh, Mike, he has an orange car as well. Uh -huh. So, and What's he keeps this very orange, I think they call it. Very orange, yeah. And you also polished it to yeah. the max. He detailed it. It is all carbon in there, also the carbon intakes here. Mm -hmm. uh, carbon on the top, uh, carbon there. All carbon equipped. So here the carbon side panels here. And the carbon middle panel. Yeah, that's the real Sportster edition, at least from the carbon point of view. Now, the owner of this car travels a lot. And uh, that's one of the reasons that it became bricked. While on travels, no one was watching the car. So, again, if there's an application that you mentioned, that yeah. would be quite handy. Yeah, OVMS called that application. I, I, I linked it also to that movie. See, yeah. the only thing what you have to do, here's that cable, that's 120 volt, and plug it in. That's all what you have to do. Actually, mine got defects, so I, but I have a, a wall charger anyway. So, but I plug it in, I take care of my cars. So this car you can brick and that's what you have to watch. Don't brick your nice road stuff. Okay. So the next one and the last thing what we're gonna do is we wanna look at parts and we have a whole bunch of them here. We have a whole shelf of road stuff parts. Actually, that's where you can get road stuff parts. Wait a second. Okay, while we are here, we are going to parts. Um, since we have a passion for Tesla Roadsters, we have been accumulating parts now for years. And occasionally we will find someone has a cache or a stash of parts somewhere. Yeah. These parts actually came out of the UK. We, um, we picked up, uh, these are new out of stock NOS switch packs for the 1.0 Roadsters. Oh wow. These are yes. probably the only ones left in existence because we're told that uh, Tesla corporate uh, generally throws away anything Roadster related. Lots of stories from uh, ex-employees about uh, things going into the dumpster. And uh, you saw that piece in the Tesla number five. Exactly. That's the same piece. That's the piece. So um, this is the, um, uh, the AC controller. On two occasions, we've actually had Tesla come to us for this part because it's no longer in production. <laughs> we have brand new, uh, new out of stock AC controllers. And we're also able to repair them. So when we get the cores, we will fix them and put them back in service. I um, one time had an AC problem and they, they fixed something there. There was a fan uh, in the, uh, the AC not working. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, other things we may never sell. Um, these, I believe, are the emergency brake cables, and we probably have uh, 50 or 100 of them. <laughs> but um, the point is, if you need parts, uh, we certainly will look to see what we have either here or in donor cars. And if we move over to this section here, yeah. we can take a look at the donor cars. But before we go there, I would like to show your viewers an actual Tesla Roadster battery pack. There are 6,831 lithium ion cells in each pack. There are nine bricks per sheet, and these bricks are all connected in parallel. So you have little vape cigarette cells that are connected in parallel in each brick. And then there are 11 sheets in each battery pack, ESS pack. Yeah. There's, oh. there's uh, one, two sheets are missing here. There are two sheets missing. We, um, we sold these two to a customer that had bad sheets, and uh, we generally use these uh, to replace sheets that will no longer come back to life. 
So basically this is a pack which could not come back to life, but there is a, probably a good sheet in there and exactly. that's what you could use. And this is one of the first generation packs and then we also have a 3.0 battery pack that we use for parts. Oh, can you show me that as well? Mm -hmm. Sure, that? let's go look. Because I want to see what the difference is. Okay, coming now to the 3.0 battery pack. So, and you said you are looking for differences, but physically they look the same, right? It's the same housing, it's the same size for sheets, but there are some differences in that pack. Do you think there are differences in a controller or in, in whatever or there? Um, we don't know for certain precisely what the differences are yet. And Be it's because what my idea is, l let me th think like that, there are Model S batteries and they are not that good anymore and people want to exchange them, mm -hmm. 7,100. So I only need 6,300 for these ones. Mm -hmm. What is if, we, if I put a Model S battery and exchange them with these ones? So put a Model S battery in there. I might not reach 300 miles range or 360 miles range, but I'm probably going, going back to 200 miles range. Sure. Right? At, at this point, we don't even know how they crack these open and change the cells in the sheets. Oh. So that's the... You, you don't know how to open these ones in order to take the batteries out, right? Exactly. So we need to solve that mystery. Because what I've heard is they're all manual manufactured. Mm -hmm. So they are not automated with a machine or something like that. There are people sticking batteries in those sheets. Sure. Right. And So the other thing about these packs is um, if, you, um, if you notice here, there are fuses inside this pack. This pack is completely sealed. It sits up inside the bowels of the car. And um, from a design standpoint, you have to question why would you put a part that could potentially need to be replaced in such an inaccessible place? Yeah, a fuse, because there is then a liquid all around it, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So in order to open it, you have to put the liquid out, the cooling liquid, right. and then you can get to one of those fuses here in order to replace the fuse. Plus that's, you have to drop the battery pack, you have to open it, crack it open. and uh, Yeah, that's, an, that's a DC fuse, looks like. Wow. Now, in the Model S, these kinds of design improvements uh, were, um, uh, were already made. But um, our impression is that uh, the goal with the Roadster was to get a product to market as quickly as possible. And some of these design considerations have to take a back seat. Yeah. Now it's difficult for, company, um, uh, for companies like us to retrofit something like this because there's, a, there's just a finite amount of space inside the Roadster. Yeah. So we so, do our best. So that battery pack is not revivable anymore? That's why you have it here? or um, It is possible it's revivable, but it's worth more to us for parts. Because, for example, we have a 3.0 battery pack back there that has yeah. two bad B&B &B sheets yeah. or a boards. Those boards will come out of this donor pack. Okay. So, and did you take any of the sheets out of that donor pack yet or not? We have not yet. No, we've just been trickle charging this and uh, keeping it up to a certain level. Uh, do you think that is reworkable? Can you, can you take the sheets out and, and put them into a... It's, into a... it's entirely possible, but in this case what we're going to do is take the two B&B &B boards off the back of the sheets and uh, get that uh, white car working in the back. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And of course the problem is since these are limited production items, as soon as you take a part out of something it immediately makes it a parts car or a parts battery pack. And, yeah. You know, you, and it's I see that's back. an air conditioning piece, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in from the Roadster, right? That's, that's one of the new ones that we got out of the UK. Yeah, okay. Because I remember that fan broke one time. Oh, on yeah. your car? Yeah, on yeah, my car. Let me go there. This fan one time, one time broke. Is there a fan in there? Yeah, here. So, and then they had to replace the fan and it was $1,800. Yeah, and that's probably cheap. I think it's gone up from there now. Okay, not that we are poor on having no parts, because we have plenty. And we have some donor cars, <laughs> you call them, right? Exactly. So, 
And here, this is a cover. Oh no, this is a donor car. Which, okay, yeah. So many of these cars, or some of these cars, are restorable. But we find that uh, oftentimes they're worth more for parts than they are to restore them. Yeah. This particular one, we had a customer come along that needed a um, uh, that needed a replacement air conditioning compressor. So we took it out of this car, and uh, it uh, uh, so that immediately made this a parts car. Uh, we have one here that um, has some front end damage, but it runs and drives. We were able to recover the battery pack. Um, at this point, we're not sure what direction we're going to go with this car. But you can see how, the how these cars are constructed. There is a crash box in the front, which is a carbon fiber. And this one here is probably the best view. It's kind of crumpled. But this absorbs a lot of the impact during a collision and protects some of the vital components behind it, like the electronics, the, uh, the compressor, the cooling system, and some of the high voltage components. Um, invariably, during collision, the uh, suspension components are compromised. Some of the control arms, the linkages, they get bent. Here you can see a bend there. Yeah. Um, so if this car were to be put back on the road, that's where we would focus. Um, the construction of these cars is unique in another way. If you notice here the frame, this is an aluminum frame, and it's fundamentally glued together with some bolts occasionally, but that yellow, um, uh, that yellow adhesive is stronger than the aluminum that it's binding or that it's bonding together. Oftentimes we'll see the aluminum rip before the, um, uh, the adhesive rips during a collision. Wow. Yeah, this one also is. This was also a front collision here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see how mangled that section there is. I think this one actually ripped out the control arm and the tire and the wheel. Wow. Now, with this much frame damage, there's no feasible way to restore a car like this. No, it's going to be too expensive, right? Right. If so, they had a $20 million Ferrari, they would probably meticulously reconstruct all of that, but these have not come $20 million collectibles yet. Yet. <laughs> yes, as we were hoping. <laughs> so up above here, you'll see that we have some transaxles and some motors. Yeah, let me change the camera. Okay, now here there are some transaxles right, and the motors. The transaxles are the part to the left, which converts the, the, um, uh, the AC induction motor rotation uh, to the... Um, uh, to the two wheels uh, through CV joints and uh, two axles. Uh, that piece to the right there, about the size of a watermelon, is the AC induction motor that powers the Tesla Roadster. And of course, there's only one motor. Despite its seemingly small size, that AC induction motor puts out 288 horsepower at zero RPM instantly. Keep going. So then also see there, do you have some uh, a, a brake? Right, some uh, disc rotors. Disc rotors, right. Because um, I, I had, uh, Mike was so nice to give me his disc rotors because he replaced them with some high performance disc rotors and brakes. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, he only had 10,000 miles on his brakes and he gave me them, gave me them. But after 80,000 miles or so, I had to replace them. Their pads and the, so it's good that you have them because I would need some the next 80,000 miles. Sure. Um, some of the parts in the Roadster uh, are no longer being manufactured and probably will not be manufactured. We talked earlier about the Pantera transaxles. Yeah. In order to get one repaired nowadays, you basically have to go to a machine shop and have one made. Um, so we feel that transaxles like this at some point will become very valuable and sought after. And there are still some of them in this car, right? There or are. did you take them out? Yeah, uh, most of these still have the motors and drivetrains in them down yeah. below, the upper ones, I think two of them. Do you have battery packs in these cars as well or not? Yes, there's a battery pack in this Only one, in that one, charged. right? Yeah. yeah. And I believe this one is out in that one, yeah. So, and the upper one there as well, okay. Yeah. And keep this piece as well because that one time got damaged as well. But when yes. one one guy drove into my car from the back, mm -hmm. so it got cracked, and I had to replace this one with a new one there. Rear trunk lid. The difficulty with the Tesla Roadster in terms of aftermarket activity is 
there's such a small gene pool with only 2,400 cars built and probably 200 now out of commission, either yeah. totaled or uh, salvaged, um, 2,000 customers is just not large enough to start an after or a brisk aftermarket effort. Um, so getting parts for cars like this at some point is going to become far more difficult. What we're also finding is these cars used to sell at auction at what we feel were reasonable prices. Uh, now you have people snapping them up without having any clue what it's going to take to put this car back on the road. There was one that sold at auction, Coparts, about uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, we were watching it. It was a restorable car, but it had a brick battery pack. The car sold for $25,000. You've uh -huh. got a $1,000 transport cost. You've got a $30,000 battery pack. Now you've got a $55,000 car that's a salvage car. And you can buy one that runs for the same amount. So what's the point in going through all of that work? And then, of course, the body work on top of that, which is another $5,000 or so. Yeah. Um, but the uh, salvage market is pretty hot. And uh, you know, people are buying them without realizing what the uh, final cost is going to end up being. So it's difficult for us to get parts cars. So my message to you guys is stop buying salvage cars. Let us buy them. <laughs> OK. I said something about reworking a PEM. Now we have an open PEM here. And that's what we want to look at. So that's a PEM from a 2.0 or 2.5 Pro stuff, probably, right? That's not the, the original PEM. 2.0, I believe. Yeah. So this is a Tesla Roadster PEM, covers off it. Uh, one of the first things that we noticed as we started to take these apart, these are sealed very nicely. There's a uh, foam uh, ridge all the way around, and by the time we open them up, even though they've been sitting in the trunk getting dusty and dirty, they are immaculately clean inside well designed. These were made originally in Taiwan by a company called Chroma, which no longer produces them. We wish they did because we would be able to buy parts and PEMs. Now, the wear items in this PEM, this is, uh, this is an electronic uh, product. And you can see these large blue things. These are electrolytic capacitors. This is essentially a uh, short-term battery it's basically the same technology. And um, the problem is it dries up with age. And as these age, they become resistive. And when they become resistive, they no longer do the filtering work. By the way, there are three inverters here. One, two, three. These three comprise the three-phase connection to the AC induction motor, which is a three-phase motor. Yeah. And a three-phase AC motor is one of the most efficient rotating devices made because the 120 degree phase relationship between the voltages actually pulls the rotor. So it can, that's why you don't have start capacitors on a three-phase motor. Now these capacitors as they age have to be replaced. And the average age of a capacitor shelf life is about eight years. We change these in the uninterruptible power systems every eight years on schedule. Inside a PEM, you have to do the same thing. And as we pointed out earlier, if you fail to, um, uh, to change these, they eventually become resistive. The byproduct of resistance with voltage is heat. And as they heat up, they eventually go into thermal runaway and you get a cap that explodes inside this clean environment. And what's inside this capacitor is a combination of insulator and foil material, aluminum foil, which as it explodes, puts all kinds of conductive debris on all these circuit boards. So usually when you have that type of failure, this PEM is no longer usable. Wow. So th this PEM looks really clear, cl clean. It's, it's very super clean. clean. It's almost like a new, cl new PEM. Mm -hmm. And all the ones we open up are generally this way because of this nice seal that they put on the PEM. Now the other things that need to be changed, there is a uh, small micro switch here, which is the interlock door for this fuse box. We change this because it's a switch and you have contacts that can corrode. We change all the relays. These are mechanical devices. These are megapole relays. And there are a bunch of them underneath here that do the heavy power switching. Again, relays um, are two contacts coming together. And there's voltage and current. And they eventually arc and pit. Yeah. So it's a good idea to change those along with the fuses, which are very inexpensive. So, in terms of wear items, those are the things that we end up changing in a panel. 
Good. And then you have the complete PEM overhauled. Right. The PEM is not good for what, another eight to ten years. And then eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do. Then you then the, the car stays longer. And I think do you think that Tesla still have some spare PEMs or don't they have spare PEMs anymore? Um, you know, it depends on the month. Sometimes they have none and sometimes they come up with some. We have no idea how they get them. They may go to auctions like we do and buy PEMs. But um, they may overhaul old ones or could right. Be, yeah. Could be, right? Until Tesla talks to us, we have no idea, and it's all conjecture. <laughs> we would wish that you we talk to them. Yes, that yes, you talk to us. So, and there is also where they, they call it the pen cleaning. So, mm -hmm. when they had to clean the pen, when there's dust in there, where is that happening? That's pretty heavy. That piece. Yeah. So. So, what you see here is um, a dirty pen. Yeah. And these are shipping peanuts from the pen being shipped to us before this goes back in the car, of course, it'll be clean. Those three inverters that you saw yep. have heat sinks. And these aluminum heat sinks, to increase the surface area, have these plates. What happens is there is a fan down below in the rear end of the car that sucks up the debris from the road and cool air, hopefully, Yeah. and then runs Not it so much in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> and then runs it through these heat sinks. And depending on how dusty your environment is, if you live on a dirt road, you probably have to have your pen cleaned every month or two. Yeah. Um, on a normal city street, they recommend about a year, once a year. Yeah. But you can't let this lapse because as this fills up with dust, debris, leaves, twigs, then there's no cooling else, anymore, right? Exactly. The cooling begins to deteriorate. And uh, my first roadster, by the way, the 2011, in um, the green one. Yeah, the green one. When yeah. I first got it. I remember I'd be driving down the street in the middle of summer, it gets 115 in Phoenix, and suddenly it would say, power reduced, PEM overheating. Uh, that happened to me every summer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, once we cleaned the PEM, I noticed that that went away for at least a while. Another thing that's interesting about this PEM, yeah. these connectors uh, connect to various uh, points outside the car. Um, this one in particular, Peter is not here right now, but I believe it's this one. This is the fan uh, control PEM, and there are either one or two fans down here that suck up the cooling air. Yeah. These pins are undersized, and there's some specifications that I could give you if I memorized all this, but I don't. But the amperage of those pins is insufficient. So oftentimes what happens is these begin to heat up, then they, um, they corrode, it reduces the amount of current or voltage available to the fan, so that reduces cooling even further, and eventually these burn up. Ooh. Oftentimes, the only solution that Tesla has, since they don't go inside the PEM to repair it, is to replace the entire PEM. Now you have a $10,000 problem, or most recently, and only, the and only the connector is what is different. Precisely, precisely. And in, instead of putting that. bigger pins in there, the only right. what it needs to happen is you need to have bigger pins exactly. in order to get the current through, right? This is a Molex connector, and there is a higher current version of this available, which is part of the retrofit that we do when we repair these oh, pins. Oh, you also them. replace them? You also upgrade them? Yes, because cool. there's, a, there's a warranty claim coming if you don't. There's another anomaly with that connector, which is kind of interesting. It's something we discovered a few years ago. You can see these things are not light. No. Um, there is what's called pin deflection and you can see the pins down there as you uh, plug and unplug the uh, connecting uh, cables to clean the PEM yeah they start pushing on those pins and if you notice there's nothing captivating them so eventually that they're, 90 they're pushing degrees out. starts pushing up now you have even less surface area between the pin and socket which yeah. contributes to the overheating problem, the additional current draw, and eventually the connector burns up. Yeah. So we have a retrofit. Not only do we replace that connector with a higher current connector, but we also encapsulate those pins so, so that they don't press up again. In, exactly, they will yeah. not deflect once you yeah. plug the uh, pins yeah. in. So now tell me, can I, can we say that here? What is a what is an overhaul of a pen cost? Um, it's around five thousand dollars. Yeah. But it's essentially like giving the customer a brand new PEM because all of the wear items have been replaced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tesla's answer is a PEM replacement, which is about eight to ten thousand dollars. 
Yeah. And um, we're not certain. We have not taken one apart. We don't know whether they're changing the insulating material, which is another important uh, part of this. I don't have one apart here to show you, but there are a number of transistors mounted on each of these inverter stacks. And those transistors have that insulating material to the heat sinks. And that insulating material was deficient from uh, uh, the get-go and it actually deteriorates and crumbles. So we have a much higher grade material that we use yeah. that not only improves the lifespan of that material, but improves the temperature or the transfer of heat to that heat sink. Now having said all that, Let's I would go like through. to show you a Model S inverter. And this well, particular well, one, PEM. This yeah. Is, yeah, this is the, um, the equivalent of a PEM in a uh, Roadster in the Model S. It's a, it's a circular design, of course. And there are three inverters, just like there are in that PEM. We have not successfully reverse engineered this yet, but the first thing that jumps out is this is about a third the size of that um, of yeah. that Roadster PEM. And if you notice, there are no large capacitors on here anywhere. So once we successfully reverse engineer this, we'll figure out how they're doing this. I think the capacitors are not needed anymore. Quite possibly, but probably yeah. they could push it directly into the battery, mm -hmm. right? So that because it's or push it directly into the motor and right. the electricity or push it back into the battery. And this is also quite a bit lighter. Here you can see the cooling jackets. Yeah, the, the cooling liquids go through here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and cools them. So there's no air cooling for this one anymore. No. Yep. And overall it's a much better design, which is actually what um, something we've noticed, the differences between the Roadster and the Model S. Tesla really learned quite a bit. In such, such a short, short time. Yes. Yeah. Now imagine the other car manufacturers now have to repeat that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, hey, let's close that. Thank you very much okay. for well, the nice welcome. introduction. My pleasure. And uh, we hope that you can make more business. And uh, we, I, I might come back to buy some parts for my Woodstar. Oh, I have the pen being overhauled completely sure because there will be a time my roadster is now 2011 so 2019 which is not far away mm -hmm. where probably some of those parts are failing or going back going damaged so thank you very much keep that here thank you for coming by Rolf okay, thank you take care okay take care Say